They uh, encourage patients to be the voice for their care and treatment. And I don't see that as much in other organizations. And I feel like that is so necessary for patients to feel like they have a voice and they can make change in regards to their care and treatment. Belonging to an uh, independent advocacy organization like AAKP gives me the confidence that I can represent them and uh, people living with kidney disease um, to represent them honestly. Our objective over the, the, the coming decade is to reach people around the globe and not, not just limit it to uh, the United States because kidney disease is, is a universal disease. Welcome to today's Healthline webinar, the latest in our COVID-19 series, the VA Kidney Program's Response to COVID-19, an AAKP webinar hosted with our Strategic Federal Partner Veterans Health Administration. I would like to give a special thank you to our webinar sponsor, Mellencrop Pharmaceuticals, who you will hear from at the end of today's presentation. AAKP is the nation's largest independent kidney patient organization, and we are vigorous advocates for the right of patient consumers to choose the therapies that align best to their personal aspirations and life goals, including kidney transplants and home dialysis. AAKP's Healthline webinar program falls under our Center for Patient Research and Education. We believe patient and caregiver education is an integral part of treatment and protection of patient lives. AAKP works to ensure that patients remain at the center of all kidney research and policy that impacts their lives. This includes federal policies and private sector innovations that impact healthcare services, assistance programs, and access to new products and services. This is especially true during national emergencies, such as the coronavirus pandemic, because kidney patients are considered among the most vulnerable populations. At this time, I'd like to introduce AKP's president, Richard Knight. Thank you, Anne. Richard is a former in-center hemodialysis patient who received his kidney transplant 14 years ago. Thank you for joining us today, Richard. Thank you, Aaron. And I thank everyone who joined this webinar today. In joining us on this call, you are showing concern for our kidney patients, our veterans, and recognizing the threat that COVID-19 brings to us. We certainly want to thank our strategic federal partner, the Veterans Health Administration, represented by Dr. Crowley today, as well as my fellow patients from AAKP who are veterans. Ed Hickey, who serves as the AK AAKP Secretary and Chair of the AAKP Veterans Health Initiative, and Kent Bresler, AAKP board member and an ambassador. We thank them for their service to our country, as well as their commitment to AAKP. We have for 50 years served as an independent voice of patients, and we take our role in educating patients and providing policy leaders insights into patients' concerns very seriously. The COVID-19 is, is a severe threat to all Americans, especially those with underlying health conditions and who are immunosuppressed, like kidney patients, including me. 
but ask a favor of all of those who are listening. We need for you to stay connected to AAKP and to share your involvement in our online efforts. Although our reach is growing, we believe that we need to continue to educate more patients on how serious this virus is and the threat that they face. I will now ask my fellow transplant recipient and AAKP Chair of Policy and Global Affairs, Paul Conway, to talk about our survey research that leads in part to today's program. Paul? Thank you very much, Richard. For those who are listening, the Center for Patient Engagement and Advocacy and the Center for Patient Education and Research are two centers of AAKP that rely heavily on the feedback and opinions and insights of kidney patients. On this slide, you'll see at the top center a survey that we had done in early March asking patients about their perceived threat of coronavirus. And we also asked a series of questions about how often they had been contacted or if they had been contacted at all by their medical professionals. 78% of the patients that we surveyed indicated that they believed that uh, as a kidney patient, they were vulnerable to the virus. Further questions identified that many of them had not even had a discussion with their doctors, nor did they know the right questions to raise. And that triggered a series of webinars, one of which you're participating in today. AATP uses survey research to engage with major federal cabinet agencies like the VA, HHS, and the Department of Defense, each of which have a hand in kidney disease research and especially frontline treatment for kidney disease patients, including veterans. We work closely with the federal government and with the Congress and the White House to inform them of your opinions and your insights and to share unique concerns that this community has, and especially those of veterans, on different proposals and programs that are being discussed so that an independent voice of kidney patients with practical knowledge of what it means to manage the disease or as caregivers to manage kidney veterans, how those concerns are impacting them and how they could best be addressed. We encourage everyone who's listening on this phone call to be engaged with AAKP and to stand by because we will be having research efforts come out to you and opportunities to participate in flash surveys. As the son of a U.S. veteran of the Navy and the Marine Corps, I thank you for listening and I thank you for the honor to serve you today. Back over to you, Aaron. Thank you so much, Paul. I'd now like to introduce Ed Hickey. Mr. Hickey serves as Secretary of AAKP and Chair of the AAKP Veterans Health Initiative. Mr. Hickey served as an infantry officer in the USMC as a lieutenant with postings in Quantico and Camp Pendleton. His distinguished public service career includes posts on Capitol Hill as an administrative assistant at the U.S. Department of Congress, Commerce as a special assistant, and following the terror attacks of September 11, 2001, as the Senior Advisor for Homeland Security for the Director of the Office of Personnel Management under President George W. Bush. At OPM, Mr. Hickey also served as liaison to veteran service organizations nationwide, including the Vietnam Veterans of America, AMVETS, the Veterans of Foreign Wars and the, Foreign Wars and the American Legion. Mr. Hickey coordinated extensively with the White House and elected leaders and staff in the U.S. House and Senate to help create the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He also represented veteran stakeholder interests in the preservation of veterans' legal rights during reforms to U.S. civil service laws. He is a recipient of a Silver Helmet Award from AMVETS and the Theo Theodore Roosevelt Rough Rider Special Re Recognition from the Director of the Office of Personnel Management. In addition to his attorney role at O'Melveny and Myers, Mr. Hickey is actively involved with community service efforts in California through the Inner City Law Center of Los Angeles, which services veterans and their families in the Los Angeles, California area. He is also active in the Armed Forces Committee and Veterans Legal Service Project of the LA County Bar Association, which works to identify and address opportunities to assist veterans, active military personnel, and reservists with their legal needs. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I turn things over to you, Ed. Thank you very much, Aaron. It's an honor to be with all who are listening today. To my fellow veterans, let me say that I understand the journey 
I've served as a caregiver to kidney patients and a McKinney patient myself. My family with a long history of military service has received care through the uh, Department of Veteran Affairs Medical System. The Veterans Health and Health Initiative <clears throat> is based within the AAKP Center for Patient Engagement and Advocacy and is designed to advance research, innovation, and policies aimed at safeguarding the highest standards of kidney care and treatment for veterans managing kidney disease, both inside and outside the VA medical system. AAKP launched VHI at the groundbreaking 2017 Kidney Innovation Summit at the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs in, in Washington, D.C. This summit was one of the most comprehensive kidney innovation summits the VA has ever conducted, and AAKP was proud to be involved in both the planning and presentation roles. Veterans and their families face many unique challenges related to managing their health care, and this is especially true for veterans who suffer from kidney or other complex chronic diseases. I'm committed to making certain that my fellow veterans have their voice heard, retain access to care they have earned, and are legally entitled to at the VA and elsewhere, and gain the benefit of new research and innovations in the realm of biologics, diagnostics, and devices. The Veterans Health Initiative has played an instrumental role in raising your multiple concerns about patient care choice and access to transplantation to the White House as well as on Capitol Hill. As advocates of innovation, VHI and AAKP have also partnered with the American Society of Nephrology and the Department of Veterans Affairs to recruit patients to test the new nutrition mobile app for veterans and other individuals managing kidney disease. VHI has also offered free virtual employment fairs with our partner organization, Career Echo, to connect employers interested in hiring veterans, especially those who are managing kidney disease, so the veterans have as many opportunities as possible to continue their professional careers and to pursue their aspirations. Similarly, we have also worked with Career Echo to conduct free college and graduate admission fairs to coordinate educational opportunities and VA educational benefits for active duty retired and families of veterans. We encourage all veterans and their families who are listening today to join the VHI and allow us to help you raise your voice on issues that impact your health, your family, and to honor your interest in continued service to your country and community. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ed. Our special guest speaker today is Dr. Susan Crowley. Dr. Crowley is a professor of medicine at the Yale University School of Medicine. Her research interests have focused on clinical interventions to reduce the morbidity and mortality of kidney disease. Dr. Crowley has published in areas of acute and chronic kidney disease. She is a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine with a specialty board in nephrology and is a fellow of the American Society of Nephrology. She was appointed VA National Program Director for Kidney Disease and Dialysis in October of 2010. As such, she has served as co-chairperson of VA's Kidney Health Committee, chartered in 2010 to provide programmatic guidance in the delivery of kidney and dialysis services for enrolled veterans. Dr. Crowley began her civilian career as the Director of Dialysis at the Veterans Administration Connecticut Healthcare System Medical Center in West Haven, Connecticut. Twice during her tenure as Director, the VA system she managed was the recipient of the Clinical Program of Excellence Award from the VA Undersecretary of Health. In 2004, Dr. Crowley assumed the duties of the Chief of the Renal Section in the VA Connecticut system, and since then has expanded the the diversity of clinical nephrology services, renal research initiatives, and training opportunities available at VA Connecticut. Dr. Crowley received her medical doctorate from Albany Medical College of Union University in New York with the support of an Armed Forces Health Profession Scholarship from the U.S. Navy. She completed her internship at the Naval, National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, and her residency in internal medicine at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Following her clinical nephrology and research fellowship training at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, she returned to active duty as the acting chief of nephrology at NNMC in the U.S. Navy. She is a recipient of the Navy Achievement Medal and the National Defense Service Ribbon for her military service during the Persian Gulf conflict. 
Dr. Crowley, we are so happy to have you joining us today. And please let me know uh, when you're ready for me to advance your slides. Well, thank you. Thank you to everybody, uh, to Mr. Knight, Mr. Conway, Mr. Bressler, and Aaron, thank you, and Mr. Hickey, obviously, um, for this invitation to chat with you today um, and, and to explain to you, perhaps share a little bit about how we're meeting the challenge of delivering care to our nation's military veterans in this era of COVID-19. If you'd go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Aaron. So I really uh, welcome this opportunity to join you all today for a number of reasons, <clears throat> but especially because the invitation came from a veterans network, that of VHI, uh, of AAKP. Uh, as uh, you heard, I come from, uh, I'm a veteran myself. I come from a family of U.S. Navy veterans. We still like the Army and the Air Force and the Marines, though, so no worries. Uh, and I feel a, really a strong allegiance and desire to engage all my fellow veterans however I can. I also admire AAKP's Veterans Health Initiative and its mission of advancing research and innovation and policies that promote really quality kidney care and treatment for veterans, both inside and outside the VA medical system. So on behalf of all my colleagues at the VA, and I want you to know I speak for all of them, uh, I want to convey to you the desire on your VA clinical team's part to contribute to AAKP's patient engagement and advocacy efforts uh, now and obviously going forward, however we can. Next slide, please. I want to start with a quote of the day. Uh, and the quote of the day uh, is excerpted from a commentary piece that was published in the Clinical Journal of the American Society of Nephrology about a year ago. And it was about a study entitled Emotional Impact of Illness and Care on Patients with Advanced Kidney Disease. So I, I mentioned this quote uh, and the commentary piece because they were penned by AAKP's own Edward Hickey, who you all know as a member on the board of the directors of AAKP and the chair of the Veterans Health Initiative. So uh, the study that Mr. Hickey reviewed was really a, a qualitative description of the journey of veterans with kidney disease, some who had transitioned to dialysis. And in his commentary, he offers reflections as a caregiver and a friend and as a Marine as well as a fellow professional. And he offered 12 tips. Perhaps the most important was the quote that you see here, which is, when you are speaking to a patient, always remember that you have the power to affect their emotional health, confidence, and optimism, and that of all those who care for that person at home. Consider your words wisely. So I use this frame as a framework for what I'll share with you today, and that instead of gloom and doom of the news that you watch on TV, I wanted to share with you some positive things that we're doing in the VA to care for veterans with kidney disease during this pandemic and what you and your caregivers can do to weather the storm. Next slide, please. And again, rather than inundate you with grim statistics, I selected a few key messages with the aim of supporting the emotional health of all of us and to hopefully inspire confidence in the healthcare system and optimism in the face of COVID-19. So there's a couple of um, key messages. And the first is really that the VHA is a healthcare system. It's part of a healthcare system. And I'll share with you in a minute what that actually means. The second message is that the VA kidney program is an integrated part of that larger healthcare system. And hopefully throughout the talk, you'll see how that is true. Third, and perhaps unbeknownst to many, is that VA has a central disaster management infrastructure and it's coordinated by their Office of Emergency Management. That's completely distinct from their emergency room uh, medical services. So it's an Office of Emergency Management, or OEM. Fourth, the VA Kidney Program has regularly coordinated with OEM in emergency preparedness planning and disaster management. Thus, the needs of people with kidney disease are on VA Office of Emergency Management, Management's radar, so much so that end-stage kidney disease is designated a vulnerable group in the VA and thus deserves special attention, uh, which is paid to veterans on dialysis during disasters, in particular dedicated outreach. And then fifth and sixth, the Office of Emergency Management, I want you to know, has a COVID-19 response plan, a well-developed COVID-19 response plan. We'll talk a little more about that. And the VA kidney program's role is really to ensure that the needs of veterans with kidney disease are met by an interpretation of the COVID-19 plan. Next slide, please. 
So let's start with the Veterans Health Administration and what that means to be a healthcare system. For those who are unfamiliar with the VA, it consists of greater than 1,200 VA facilities, including about 150 medical centers, uh, as well as 800 community-based outreach clinics, some skilled community nurse, uh, community living centers, which are like nursing homes, et cetera. So it's quite large. We have a workforce of over 300,000 employees, and we're responsible for the care of 9 million enrolled veterans across 50 states and in numerous territories, like the Mariana Islands, Guam, et cetera, 20,000 of whom enrolled veterans rely on the VA for dialysis care. VHA is the health delivery research and education component of the Department of Veterans Affairs, or what we call Big VA. And it also, Big VA also includes two other uh, administrations, the Veterans Benefits Administration, or the VBA, and the Veterans Cemetery Administration, the VCA. The latter two develop a host of educational, financial, and decedent benefits to veterans. So as you can see, it's a very large organization. It's a health system. It's the second only in size to its sister agency, the DOD. And as such, it offers not only medical care, but it aims to provide comprehensive services to meet the whole range of veterans' health needs beyond medical care. And that includes assistance during disaster and pandemics. All right, next slide, please. All right, so how about the kidney program, the VA kidney program? So it is composed not of a legion of workers in central office, which sometimes people think, but as I have always uh, interpreted, it's composed really of a totality of all your clinical and allied providers who care for veterans with kidney disease. They're doctors, PAs, nurses, nurse practitioners, our dietitians, our social workers, our farm DS, our technicians, um, as well as uh, primary care teams, et cetera. But those are our core you know, providers uh, for the kidney program. And the VA Kidney Program's mission is really to improve the quality and consistency of healthcare services that are delivered to veterans with kidney disease nationwide. Uh, the VA Kidney Program is guided by a national VA Kidney Health Committee. It was formerly called the Dialysis Steering Committee for the uh, past decade, uh, but now has grown to extend to upstream uh, earlier forms of kidney disease. And the Kidney Health Committee has representatives from nephrology, nursing, surgery, finance, contracting, analytics, and facility leadership. So it's a very uh, multidisciplinary uh, committee to oversee care. We also interface with VA's Office of Emergency Management, our Public Health Office, our Connected Care Office, and partner with other federal agencies. Uh, for instance, with CMS's or Center for Medicare and Medicaid's uh, uh, CASER or Emergency Responsiveness Group as well as industry, the dialysis industry in particular, as well as the private sector that's engaged in kidney health care and emergency preparedness. Okay, next slide, please. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about our VA's disaster management infrastructure. I mentioned we do have one. And of course, that gives us a huge advantage um, uh, to have such an infrastructure available. So our disaster management uh, infrastructure is really led by our Office of Emergency Management, or OEM, and what they're charged with is really doing, ensuring that we have coordinated oversight of disaster management for VA, and it does this by planning. In fact, the Office of Emergency Management has had a defined strategy to address infectious pandemics modeled after influenza going back to at least 2006, probably earlier, but I found one even in 2006. And this has been modified and updated and it's specific for a COVID-19 plan. So we actually have a uh, defined plan which is freely available on the web. As I mentioned before, the Office of Emergency Management works with the kidney program to ensure the delivery of kidney care during times of disaster. Uh, for instance, we have partnered to develop consistent patient messaging for our dialysis population, and we've identified them, as I said, as one of the vulnerable patient groups that requires outreach safety checks in disaster zones. The Office of Emergency Management also works in lockstep with other federal agencies, such as uh, Health and Human Services, FEMA, or a Federal Emergency Respo Response, to assist in the coordination of a national health care uh, response to disasters, including COVID-19. And in fact, a little known thing is that VA's fourth mission, besides health delivery, education, and research, is to provide assistance to the nation in times of crisis. So uh, we are, in fact, doing that. 
So the VA, the VA was in fact called upon to deploy personnel to New York City Javits Center, et cetera, and it's provided humanitarian relief in other disasters as well. So if you want to know more about information about what VA is doing to address the COVID-19 pandemic, we do have a website, the public health website, that you can access to uh, find out some general information. Okay, next slide, please. I mentioned that we have a COVID-19 response plan, and uh, this is this is it in a nutshell, essentially. Uh, it's a four-phase plan that aligns with the other federal agency responses and their stages, and the goals are really to limit the spread of COVID-19 infection to veterans and staff, to provide care for those who are infected with COVID-19, but also to provide continuity of care for our non-infected veterans and to provide resources to HHS, Health and Human Services, and the support of the nation. So the VA COVID response plan, there's a link there. It's available on the public domain uh, if you're interested in looking at that. Next slide, please. I won't go through the details of the plan, but I wanted to just show you one of the things is to uh, perform actually a uh, centralized tracking surveillance mechanism for COVID-19 infection amongst uh, our veteran patients and, and the staff in the VA. And this is just a snapshot. This was as of the 18th of May that summarizes the total cumulative cases uh, that we're managing, the active cases uh, currently, those that are convalescent, and those who had unfortunately have passed away. Uh, the current numbers are not terribly different from the 21st, uh, but I just wanted to show this to you as an example. Uh, the website, this is again uh, in the public domain, and the website URL is, is below. All right, next uh, slide. So all that was a bit of a long prelude to really talking about the VA kidney program's response to COVID-19. So what have our goals been in the kidney program? Well, they've been really to continue to address the healthcare needs of veterans across the whole spectrum of kidney disease. Uh, be it those with, who have chronic kidney disease, those who have acute kidney impairment, those who have kidney failure, and those who've had kidney transplants. Uh, another goal is to continue to inform and to adhere to CDC's principles of public health to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in the VA kidney care spaces. And then finally, to implement contingency planning in collaboration with our Office of Emergency Management to maintain the operational readiness of our VA kidney health services for veterans both in and out, uh, who are in as well as outpatients. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we have uh, contingency plans. So that's one of our charges. And the way we've thought about it is we can think about our veterans in three groups. Those who have chronic kidney disease, so they're ambulatory, they're outpatient. Those who are hospitalized and need perhaps inpatient kidney support. And those who have outpatient maintenance dialysis needs. So let's look at the first group and see what we've done there. I'll just bring highlights of what we've done for each one of these groups. So for veterans with chronic kidney disease, uh, as you uh, may be aware, the VA has really been a leader in telehealth uh, throughout the nation long before COVID uh, and uh, has developed an array of virtual care services, uh, be it uh, video to video, uh, home to clinic types of consultations, what we call CVT, or whether it's using smartphones to do what we call VVC, VA Video Connect, uh, whether it's using our electronic health record and secure messaging through that mechanism, um, whether it's uh, uh, just doing simple telephone calls uh, to the VA back and forth. So we've really uh, been a leader in the whole telemedicine uh, opportunity uh, that is now being um, explored by a number of uh, other groups as well as the VA. And what we've done here for our chronic kidney disease patients is we've really tried to ramp up uh, the use of our virtual care modalities. Uh, initially, we were trying to really promote use of uh, VA Video Connect, which is where uh, your provider using their phone or their computer can connect to the veteran patient if the veteran patient has their own uh, smartphone and or computer. But uh, the VA has gone beyond that now and said, you know, opened it up so that now we can use FaceTime, Doximity, any host of uh, these virtual mechanisms in order to connect with veterans are now permissible. And like I said, probably the most popular, though, that we found is the phone. <laughs> Always worked before, and it still works now. Um, so uh, that is really what we've been doing for our veterans with chronic kidney disease. We've been doing that in lieu of face-to-face -face visits to try to 
you know, adhere to social distancing, et cetera, and not expose people unnecessarily to risk. And so this has enabled a continuity of care while adhering to all those principles of infection prevention. And so far, we've had a wonderful response from veterans. Next slide, please. With regard to uh, what we've been doing for hospitalized veterans with dialysis needs, uh, we've really we've augmented staffing, equipment, and supplies to meet inpatient needs. For example, the VA has a system in place to deploy our dialysis staff to wherever they're most needed. Uh, so, for example, uh, we had a doctor from White River Junction, which is in New England, and he joined the Manhattan VA to assist them with delivering dialysis when they were uh, a hotspot. And likewise, nursing staff has been redeployed to hotspots uh, across the area. That's all coordinated through the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, the VA has also executed some national dialysis emergency equipment contracts, and we've done that to procure uh, and augment our inpatient dialysis capabilities, uh, including uh, expanding our ability to dialyze, quote unquote, in the home in our community living centers or our, our nursing homes so patients don't have to uh, necessarily go out to a dialysis unit that was in Pittsburgh. Uh, we've also done uh, both in and outpatient dialysis supplies. We've made sure that those have been prioritized uh, for VA's National Emergency Supply Management System. Uh, and uh, what I just show you here uh, and I try to depict is a very streamlined process for clinical uh, critical supply acquisition. This is uh, essentially what we call our emergency management coordination cell. And it allows us to quickly obtain critical supplies like PPE, COVID-19 tests, and now dialysis supplies have been added to that. So what happens is that at a facility, if they uh, believe that they uh, have a shortage or anticipate a shortage of essential dialysis supplies, they advise their facility supply chain officer he notifies the Office of Emergency Management Coordination Cell. There's an uh, electronic mechanism to do that. And they trigger our procurement, procurement and logistics office to take action. Uh, the number of actions they can do might include what we call cross-station leveling, meaning taking surplus supplies from one facility and transferring them to another facility that's running short. They can do and execute an emergency contract like we did for equipment uh, and get that very quickly. Uh, or they can reach out to FEMA uh, if they need to. So then that helps close the loop. So those are the things we've been doing to maintain our operational responsiveness for our hospitalized uh, veterans in particular. Next slide, please. And in terms of what we've been doing for um, our outpatient uh, maintenance dialysis uh, patients and meeting their needs, uh, what I can tell you is that all our VA units have been following CDC guidance. Uh, we do pre-entry screening both at the beginning of the VA facility, and every VA facility has a separate entrance for employees, one for staff, then they have a separate entrance. If you happen to have COVID-19, um, you have to come through a separate entrance. But we do this again in front of our dialysis units. So prior to entering your dialysis, your VA dialysis unit, your nurses will pre-screen uh, you again both verbally, check your temperature, and then we, uh, all the VA facilities have an opportunity for rapid referral of veterans for testing for uh, COVID-19. We all practice social distancing. You may notice your waiting room chairs are gone. <laughs> There's one every six feet, um, but uh, that is a necessity. Uh, and we also do separate uh, patients within the unit as well. We all encourage hand washing and PPE use are uh, fairly rigidly enforced as well as universal source control. It is now a requirement for every VA, though we've been doing this in our dialysis units um, for a couple months now, is masking all our patients and our staff. It's required. We also practice temporal and special, uh, spatial segregation of COVID-19 positive and what they call PUIs or patients under investigation. Uh, what that means is that uh, if we have somebody who uh, is uh, an outpatient and they're well enough to go home, but they happen to be either uh, known positive or uh, suspected for that, we'll dialyze the patient in isolation. If we have more than one patient, then we uh, will put them on the last shift uh, of the day or after hours um, so we can practice that segregation. We also do environmental and equipment disinfection. Everybody's required to use of these EPA-approved cleaners that's uh, absolutely mandated uh, and, again, all consistent with um, CDC. And then we follow the CDC's guidance on discontinuation of COVID-19 precautions, 
and return to work for staff. Those are the standards that have been established by the CDC. So those are all the things we've been doing in our dialysis units and uh, in order to maintain the safety of our veteran patients with, uh, who need maintenance dialysis. We've also been collaborating with dialysis industry partners to ensure access to care for our veterans who are dialyzing in the community. The vast majority of veterans actually die dialyze in the community in, uh, um, under a contract, VA contract. And so we are part of what the, what's called the DISCERN team. Uh, it's an acronym for the Dialysis Services Collaborative Network. And that's really a consortia of the dialysis providers uh, working in the community as well as the VA to ensure that our veterans have access to care. Um, the VA has also issued a waiver, our um, Office of uh, Care in the Community. They have contracting within them. They issued a waiver to ensure that our veterans were able to have fluid facility assignment in the community uh, based on their uh, COVID-19 status. So if uh, they, they had COVID-19, and they needed to be uh, segregated to a COVID-19 shift and their facility couldn't accommodate them, we would make sure they could get that without any hiccups. All right, next slide. I wanna tell you a little bit about some of our related programs, uh, VA programs uh, related to kidney disease that have been impacted by COVID-19 and what we're doing about that. So the first is our VA Office of Surgical Services. Uh, they are uh, responsible for the veteran surgical services, including kidney transplantation, uh, as well as peritoneal dialysis uh, access placement and vascular access placement for those who are on hemodialysis. Uh, essentially, they've been following all the federal guidance about surgery, uh, when you can offer surgery, and it has to be based on patient need or the surgical priority, and also considering the prevalence of COVID-19 in the facility uh, and in the environment and the status of PPE. So it's been very similar to the private sector. I'm pleased to tell you that um, we just chatted with uh, the surgical uh, chiefs, the director of surgery and uh, representatives from our various transplant programs. And while uh, deceased donor transplant has been available on a case-by-case -case basis, and that's been going forward, while uh, living kidney uh, donation had been suspended, they're hoping to resume the latter uh, in June. So uh, at least at selected uh, VA centers. We do have seven VA transplant centers that do kidney transplant. We have a number of others that do other solid organs, but we have seven kidney transplant centers. But, uh, and we have asked for prioritization of vascular access creation, PD catheter placement, et cetera, as we move forward. But they're gonna do it very cautiously and make sure it's safe. I also wanted to mention to you about our caregiver program. The VA does have a caregiver program, support program. I've given you the link here, and there's also a tip sheet. But most importantly, and this is a rarity you'll find in the federal government, there's a phone number to call. So, um, so uh, I wanted to make you aware that there is a veteran caregiver support program there. So you can call to find out about uh, not only emotional support, but potentially financial support for caregivers. Okay, next. I'm just gonna to touch very briefly on COVID-19 research since this is a very fluid situation and rapidly evolving, but I wanted to tell you about our Office of Research and Development. As I mentioned uh, first off in the, uh, uh, the talk was that the VA has multi a multi-pronged mission. You know, one is health service delivery, one is education, or educational education, et cetera. And then uh, the last is our, um, uh, and research is also part and parcel uh, of that. And so we have a research and development that supports our VA-based research and embeds research essentially in the fabric of the VA. So uh, they, what they do, the ORD, is they facilitate research par partnership opportunities with others like the NIH. And in fact, uh, the VA was part of this recent NIH rim Desivere trial. Uh, so the VA was part and parcel of that uh, trial. They also have an intramural program um, that meaning we fund our own internal studies that are done by VA investigators. Um, and specifically for COVID-19, they've, they've stood up a research steering committee to evaluate any promising research proposals and to do cycles of funding cycles to offer awards. For the first round, uh, they provided 13 awards for clinical trials in the VA related to COVID-19, including one that was related to kidney disease. Uh, and it's entitled The Incidents, Risk Factors, and prognosis of COVID-19 associated acute kidney injury. 
and that's by my friend, Dr. Eddie Sue, who's at the nephrologist at the Nashville VA. So I want to just let you know to all stay tuned for some breakthroughs. There's a lot of research going on uh, within the VA and also with the VA collaborating with um, uh, external entities uh, and their other federal partners. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so how about going forward? What are we doing to go forward? So the VA actually has a moving forward together plan and real, that was released on, it's actually May 7th. I thought it was May 8th, but it's May 7th. And this plan was issued to guide facilities through the national recovery phase. And what this is, it's aligned with the other federal uh, plans, which are tripartite plans or three-stage plans. So it's what they call a stage gate process. So VA facilities will not necessarily reopen, we've been open all along, but try to resume normalcy of operations through a three-stage um, process. And there's a number of criteria that you have to have. You have to have adequate PPE in your facility. You have to have adequate COVID-19 testing. And you have to have a reduction of the prevalence of and the attack rate of COVID-19 in your community. So if you have those three things, then you can proceed ahead. All right, so it's a stage gate process. You meet all those criteria, you can move through the gate to the next stage. But the key message is really in this plan is that safety is VA's number one priority. Uh, the plan is, you know, the VA considers itself a high reliability organization or it strives to be. And so this plan is founded on safety principles and guidelines uh, that include things such as physical distancing, universal screening for COVID-19, source control for everyone entering VA facilities, and again, all this is done to ensure that we have minimum exposure for our veterans and caregivers and staff. Um, you can't expect to see that there'll probably be physical plant remodeling done at the VAs. And again, that's to optimize safety. And uh, you know, ultimately the VA wants to expand their healthcare operations in a safe environment. And they'll do it according to, again, the, your clinical need and guidance from various agencies, including the state and local government. Uh, as clinically appropriate, though, I will tell you, virtual modalities are going to continue to be prioritized for the delivery of non-dialysis kidney health services. Obviously, a little more challenging to do with dialysis. But uh, in any case, I think virtual care is here to stay. It's been here in the VA for quite some time, but the rest of the world has now caught up and realized that actually it works pretty darn well. So I would encourage everybody to explore VA's connected care options. If you Google VA connected care, you'll see all the types of options they have and how to get training or uh, you can talk to your own provider about setting up now all your care through virtual mechanisms in the VA. It's actually a wonderful program. Okay, next, next slide, please. All right, so moving forward, I showed you the VA's plan, but you know, what, you, what can you do uh, to move forward through this COVID pandemic? And the first I would say, thing that I would say to you is to try to keep yourself educated, but keep yourself educated with reliable sources, with educated sources. Here is the VA's coronavirus fact sheet. Again, this has been developed, you can guarantee it's been vetted through every federal agency there is, uh, the VA, and obviously we're close partners with CDC. So you'll have good factual information in uh, the VA's communications and you can rely on those. I would also encourage you to uh, refer to uh, AAKP's guidance with regard to COVID-19. They're a wonderful partner as well in terms of giving you all the information that you need uh, and obviously the CDC as well. Next slide. But I also wanna encourage you to do really do the simple things that can prevent infections like social distancing, like getting a flu shot come around flu season. Don't forget, <laughs> influenza can seriously impair your health as well. So get that flu shot. Learn how to disinfect your home. You, I mean, you've been doing it, but you're gonna have to be doing it more frequently. Practice, uh, you know, cough etiquette. Uh, it's no more, it is really, really important now. Mask, again, if you have to go outside and try to avoid really crowded areas or small rooms that have poor ventilation. That's where you're highest risk for contracting COVID. And then obviously washing your hands. We all can't be neurotic enough uh, about washing our hands. So carry a little Purell with you um, at all times and make sure you're washing your hands. Okay, next slide. I have some resources here for veterans and others uh, uh, with uh, kidney disease about COVID-19. Uh, the VHA fact sheet, there's the link there. 
um, uh, the VA's coronavirus disease webpage. Again, if you click on that link, you should be able to get to it. Um, our, not, our COVID-19 response plans, most of these you just Google and you'll, you can also find them. The Access to Care webpage to look at the statistics, I showed you that uh, chart. That's uh, the real-time map-based data on COVID-19 in the VA. And so the VA has been maximally transparent about COVID-19. There's also, I found there's a coronavirus FAQs, what veterans need to know uh, by the VA. So uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, good tips there. And there's a Q&A about how COVID-19 can affect your health appointments, benefits, and services. So if you have any questions about that, you can go to this chat box. Okay, next slide, please. And then here's some resources for veterans and others uh, with kidney disease, They're just general, that are good information. AAKP, number one, all right? Um, I do want to tell you VA Kidney Program has a homepage, so please feel free to uh, go there. It can tell you about where the facilities are. It has um, some kidney education. It has a link to our eKidney Clinic, which is a online tutorial, web-based tutorial. If you have any questions, you can email us at the VHA National Kidney Program Office, all one word, VHA National Kidney Program Office at va.gov, all right? Um, and actually, see that myself or uh, Catherine Murphy, our program manager, <laughs> uh, answer those emails. Uh, our eKidney Clinic, you can also access directly. The link is there. We have a VA mobile kidney app. Like I, told, I mentioned, VA has really been doing lots and lots of virtual care, and we have a beautiful mobile app uh, if you'd like to uh, try that, please go right ahead. Uh, there's some information about telehealth. My Healthy Vet is the veteran's electronic health record. Really, literally the veteran's electronic health record. You go into your health record. You can see your appointments. You can refill your medications. You can see all your notes. You can see everything. Um, and you can download it. They have a blue button for download as well. And then you have the Veteran Health Library, which has lots of resource materials in there. Okay, uh, next slide, please. I want to wrap up again about the quote of the day. Um, coming back to that, I'll return to this quote about uh, when you're speaking to patients, remember that you have the power to affect their emotional health, their confidence, and optimism. So I hope I've added to your emotional health today uh, and perhaps bolstered your confidence uh, in the VA healthcare system and inspired some optimism in the path forward through this COVID-19 pandemic. And then last slide, please. And uh, since uh, this is a preceding Memorial Day uh, holiday, I wanted to remind you to take a moment on Monday to remember and give thanks for our fallen heroes. And I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Crowley. This is a really wonderful presentation. We have uh, one final speaker, and then we'll um, open up for questions. Mr. Kent Bressler was diagnosed with FSGS in 1982. FSGS is a disease that causes scarring in the glomerulus of the kidney and is notorious for additional health problems, including large amounts of protein in the urine, loss of protein in the blood, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure. In 1987, Kent received a kidney from his brother, Kip. For the past 32 years, Kent has been on immunosuppressive drugs, that are essential in guarding against rejection of the transplanted kidney, but also can have harmful long-term side effects. Kent served in the U.S. Army Medical Corps from 1970 to 1972 and was an RN in the Veterans Administration for 22 years. In addition, he has a 20-year career as an RN at Peterson Hospital in Kerrville, Texas, where he, where he was Administrative Director of Medical Staff Services. Kent is an active peer mentor and consumer advisor participating in chronic kidney disease research reviews from the U.S. Department of Defense and is an experienced consumer peer reviewer for Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, also known as PCORI. Kent retired in 2018 and founded Kidney Solutions, a 501c organization that works with patients and families to identify living kidney donors. Their services are free, and they work closely with the medical community in the San Antonio area. Kent, we're happy that you, you're able to join us today, and I'll turn things over to you. Howdy, everyone. 
uh, Kent Bressler here, and uh, as a retired VA registered nurse, kidney transplant recipient of now 33 years, and an Army veteran, it is truly a privilege to talk with you today. I spent 22 years working in the Veterans Administration space and would like to first mention and thank those who are currently working uh, on the front lines within the many VA facilities. They're taking care of our most precious resource, that being the American veteran. We must take into account that we are in uncharted territory with this virus, and the care and love that the VA staff is exhibiting is, in my opinion, tremendous. From experience, I know the dedication and the perseverance that VA employees exhibit. They get it. The VA has many valuable online resources for dealing with stress and anxiety during the coronavirus. Dr. Crowley mentioned a lot of the websites and a lot of the, the telemedicine, and, and uh, there are also publications that you can call on. For instance, the Veteran Resource News, Newsletter that provides up-to-date information and virtual events for veterans and their caregivers. Dr. Crowley mentioned uh, telemedicine. I was involved in telemedicine when I was in the VA, and that was, you know, quite a few years ago. Uh, but it's taken the country by storm, but <laughs> for a long time, the VA has been working with it. It was developed within the VA to address the needs of an aging population and to reach out to those in the many underserved parts of the country where distance was a limiting factor to care. Kidney patients are afforded many of these services and benefit from them. The most difficult time for most veterans as, as we speak, in the hospital or an extended care facility, including nursing homes within the VA, is the difficulty being isolated from loved ones and as we try to contain this virus. Being able to do virtual contact is of great importance and it's really refreshing to see that the VA is a leader in this area. Remember now, we have different levels of veterans who have served at different times, and they all need different interventions due to their age and conditions. So rest assured, if you're a kidney patient, or in general, just a VA patient, rest assured that those caring for the hospitalized vets our understanding of this particular difficulty. They address it on a daily basis and they do it with kindness and expedite as much care as they possibly can. We know that this virus affects those who are 65 years of age and older. With conditions such as kidney disease, we're at the high risk end. We walk the walk every day and we talk the talk about what it is to take care of ourselves. Diabetes and heart disease is also part of this, and this all makes up a large portion of the current care that's given within the VA. Rest assured, if your loved one is in a VA facility, they will get aggressive, compassionate care. The services for all age groups is superb and relentless, and in this era, era of reaching out to people in new ways, the VA is, um, has unprecedented uh, leadership in, that, in this area. So, as a 70-year-old man with kidney disease who's been transplanted and has been immunosuppressed or compromised for well over 30 years, I must be constantly observant. I need to take care of myself. You need to do the same. And as my 90-year-old Navy pilot friend said to me on many occasions on my leaving after visiting him, he said, Bress, keep on breathing. And for you out there, you all do the same. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kent. And thank you to all of our today's speakers. We'll now take a few questions. If you have a question, please go ahead and type it into the question box at the bottom of your navigation pane and press send. We've already had several questions come in, so I'll go ahead and start reading those aloud. This question is for Ed. 
I am an Army veteran and diabetic patient living in Maine with high risk for diabetic kidney disease. How can I participate in the VHI or Veterans Health Initiative virtual efforts to raise the veteran voice on Capitol Hill alongside you? Well, thanks for the question, Aaron, and uh, whoever submitted it. I, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, on our, our webpage, uh, there's information about the VHI. The webpage is aakp.org, and there's an email address, info at aakp.org. If you uh, send send something to that address, Aaron will get it, and I will get it, and we'll work to get you involved. We'd love to have you. Um, Aaron, uh, fortuitously, is the coordinator of all those efforts, and so um, I know she's listening too, so she'll she'll be looking out for your your email. And thanks for asking. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> so another question that came in is more regarding um, kidney disease and, and transplantation in general. Um, so I'm not sure if if anybody can address this or not. Uh, but the question is, if deceased donor transplants are still being done during the COVID-19 pandemic, and should those of us on the wait list expect longer wait times? So this is um, Susan Crowley. Um, they they are still being done, but obviously not at the same frequency as they were before. Uh, again, I think um, with uh, CDC did issue uh, guidance with regard to doing surgery. And you really have to take into um, consideration the prevalence of COVID, especially in the transplant center, um, the uh, preparedness for with PPE as well as testing. I think those two considerations are pretty much, you know, um, uh, have been tackled early in the pandemic. Uh, they were probably some of the leading issues. Um, but uh, so now I think it's really a matter of what's the rate of, um, of uh, the COVID uh, infection in your community, in your area, certainly in the transplant center, uh, may be the thing that predicates um, whether things go forward or not. Thank you, Dr. Crowley. Another question that came in, I have, a, I have a stage three CKD and I'm seen by the VA. Do you consider those in that stage high risk? They've been given conflicting answers. And otherwise, they want to say that their care team in the VA is wonderful and would like to give them a huge thank you. So again, um, the question is if uh, stage three CKD is considered high risk. Well, um, are, if they're talking with regard to procedures, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what procedure would be done. Uh, stage three, is it concerning? Yeah, you should be followed if you have stage three CKD, absolutely. Um, and uh, hopefully you've been referred to um, uh, a nephrologist. Uh, primary care providers in the VA are wonderful, um, and you can speak to them about your risk for progression. We do use risk prediction uh, tools um, to uh, help uh, educate and advise patients about their risk for progression. Um, but I, I, yes, stage three, you, otherwise you'll progress if you're not well controlled, et cetera. So speak to your provider about that. It is not something to ignore, that's for sure. Uh, you do need to be followed uh, and uh, optimized. Make sure your care is optimized. And you can do that by, you know, working with your uh, primary care with controlling if you have diabetes, controlling your blood sugar, getting particular medications that are really good for uh, people with kidney disease. They slow the rate of kidney disease in people with diabetes. Um, hypertension and controlling your blood pressure. Um, so, And again, there's some preferential medications that can accomplish that. And obviously weight control um, and appropriately dietary nutritional counseling. Uh, so what we call medical nutrition therapy. They're all part and parcel of, uh, of a good care plan. Could I add something there, Dr. Crowley? Sure, go right ahead. I think one of the things that the questioner might have been referring to too is, are they at high risk for co covert? Yeah, well, oh. I, I don't know, but your, your, your answer is exactly spot on. Stage three is nothing to mess with. It's progressive, yeah. it, you need to move on. But you, you know, uh, a person who is stage three and is worried about COVID, they, just, they need to make sure they wash their hands, they need to make sure they stay out of crowds, you know, just the regular things that the rest of the population is doing. 
that's mm-hmm. the most important for them. And that, and then take your advice because uh, this this disease is not fun to have, and it needs to be followed closely. Right, right. And work with your your uh, you know your physician or your provider to maintain care. Don't cut yourself off from healthcare because of COVID nineteen. Yes. Leverage these virtual tools to do that. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Great points. Thank you both so much. Uh, We'll take one final question, and this question is for Kent. Kent, we see you active on on Facebook, and we know you have podcasts where you're sharing uh, stories of individuals that have connections to kidney disease. This person is saying that they are sometimes reluctant to tell people that they have kidney disease themselves. And do you have any any thoughts or, or suggestions on how they can um, connect with others, perhaps other patients that um, that are out there um, and open and willing to share about their experiences. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm gonna I'm gonna con- make it real simple. Go to kidneysolutions.org. We can help, and we do it for free. Uh, it, mentorship is the most important thing with kidney disease. You can't go it alone. It, there's a fear factor number one. And there's an unknown factor number two, but the third thing is that you don't have to go it alone. Call someone if you that you that you know, like us at Kidney Solutions or any anybody that's got kidney disease. You, your physician can can tell you about different programs. Also, mostly I'm, I want the people to understand that you don't have to go this alone, and you need to learn as much as you possibly can and become your own advocate because you are the one that takes care of yourself. Others don't take care of you, you take care of yourself. So that's that's like the take home point is find somebody who knows. And uh, I have a podcast, I will tell you, it's Kent's, Kent's Kidney Stories. And uh, you can go on and listen to it. And who knows, give me an email. I, I'm, I'm open to discussion and help and help you find resources too, free. Thank you so much, Kent. Thank you to everybody that submitted questions. If you have a question that we did not get to today, please reach out to us at info at aakp.org and we'll work with today's speakers to provide a response. I'd like to close with a few slides about additional resources from AAKP. If you're not already a member, we encourage you to join us. We offer free membership to patients and their family members as well as living kidney donors and you can join online or by giving us a call. Please be sure to include your email address when signing up so you can be notified by email when opportunities arise where your opinions and experiences are needed to help inform innovation, advance care, and make a meaningful impact to improve lives. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities to help us elevate the patient voice and change the status quo of kidney disease care. You can also select to receive any of our five different electronic newsletters, subscribe to our printed bi-monthly magazine, AAKP Renal Life, and we also invite you to follow us on social media for all the latest news and announcements. AAKP is dedicated to helping patients understand their condition and take control of their health care. We are proud to offer a variety of resources for both patients, family members, and caregivers. By visiting our website and clicking on the AAKP store button at the top of the homepage, you can find a variety of brochures and online tools that you can order online, by phone, or download. AAKP holds a number of events throughout the year, and these events are live streamed and recorded. Please visit our YouTube channel to watch presentations from our Global Summit on Kidney Innovations, hosted in partnership with George Washington University our annual policy summit, and our annual national patient meeting. I'd like to remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded and it will be made available on our coronavirus resource page. For more resources on COVID-19 and to listen on demand to today's and any of our other previous webinars on COVID-19, with strategic partners like the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, please visit our coronavirus resource page. On the aakp.org homepage, you'll see a big red button, coronavirus information, and that will take you to this resource page. 
We'd again like to thank today's speakers for sharing with us important information. If you have a question again that we didn't get to today, please send that to info at aakp.org and we'll work with our speakers to provide a response. And in closing, I'd like to thank Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals again for sponsoring today's webinar. We have a brief message from them that I'd like to show about their commitment to the kidney patient community during this time. Hi, I'm Ross Morrissey from Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals, and I want to thank the American Association of Kidney Patients for the opportunity to provide support for this webinar and also to share this message. As a former captain in the United States Marine Corps, it is my honor as a fellow veteran and also on behalf of Mallinckrodt to thank all the veterans and active service members for their service. During this time of uncertainty, when every day seems to bring more news of change and challenge, I can't express how much we appreciate the work this organization is doing to help patients, caregivers, and this kidney community navigate through this pandemic. At Mallinckrodt, we are also identifying ways in which to help in this fight against COVID-19. For example, we are instituting a volunteer leave program to give medically trained employees paid time off to help hospitals treat or care for patients with COVID-19. Mallinckrodt is donating personal protective equipment and food to help support healthcare workers as they do their vital work. Also providing funding and materials to hospitals to conduct investigator-initiated research to use real-world evidence to help find answers. We know that if everyone does their part together, we'll get through this in the best possible way. We wish the best to you and your families. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us today. Be informed, stay safe, and have a happy Memorial Day. Thank you.